I'm John Kravitz, CIO of Geisinger Health and current Chime board chair. It's my pleasure to kick things off and introduce the first session in the Chime specialty series with health, the engaged patient as consumer, post-COVID innovation in health and care. First, a brief introduction to Chime. Chime is the College of Healthcare Information Management Executives. It consists of over 3,200 chief information officers, chief medical information officers, chief innovation officers, chief nursing informatics officers, and other healthcare IT leaders in 56 countries. Chime serves health IT leaders that are transforming healthcare by offering education and network opportunities and aim to provide health and care globally through the utilization of knowledge and technology. Now to introduce today's session. It's no question that the COVID pandemic radically changed the way our patients perceive their healthcare and their interactions with providers and clinicians. But what will that mean for patients and their providers moving forward? What healthcare change, delivery changes will stay and grow in this new area of patients and consumers? What new technologies need to be built or adopted and how will providers ensure patients have those options available? Join us as we bring global health and care systems together to discuss topics of consumerism, digital health innovation, public policy, cybersecurity, and the state of health and care. We have three phenomenal leaders that are going to help us understand this new wave of consumerism from our patients. And it's my pleasure to introduce them. First, you'll hear from Myra Davis, Chief Innovation Information Officer at Texas Children's Hospital. Next, you will hear from Neil Gomes, Senior Vice President for Digital and Human Experience with Common Spirit Health. And last but not least, you'll hear from Zane Burke, Chief Executive Officer in Livongo. I hope you enjoy today's session. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Neil Gomes. I'm the System SVP for Digital and Human Experiences at Common Spirit Health. Uh, we are a um, approximately 140 hospital system uh, in about 22 states in the United States. I'm going to talk. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, delivering the future of health today, today, and uh, and talk a little bit about three major topics um, that that I'll focus on uh, in in this session. Um, before I go into those topics, though, I'd like to uh, talk to you a little bit about the vision for the future of health that, um, uh, that, that I like to think optimistically, this is where we are going and uh, from a consumer perspective, I believe and I um, hope that the future of health will be frictionless and continuous, that we will manage our health actively and passively aided by digital products and services layered over organic consumer and clinical experiences which are really important too. I think we will discover, access, engage, and promote healthcare seamlessly, aided by consumer-focused, integrated, digital and physical experiences that both heal and delight. So with this as the context and uh, a very optimistic future, um, very similar to some of the other industries that we interact with, um, I'd like to uh, dive into three major topics. The first is patient engagement. Um, you know, post COVID, I feel, and even before, uh, you know, healthcare hasn't really engaged with patients um, in, in this continuum sense. You know, many times we focus on episodes of care and, uh, and we see healthcare as being this uh, episode centric type of service. When a patient comes to us, when a patient decides to uh, connect with our health system, or if they were already a patient, uh, when they decide to come in for a flu shot, or maybe get admitted to the ER for something that's more acute. And then we handle that um, episode really well, uh, most of the times, and, um, uh, and then the patient leaves and comes to the next time they need to, right? And, uh, and that's typical with most of healthcare, uh, but digital products, and uh, digital experiences are starting to change that, making it easier for us to stay connected with our consumer, uh, which is a different mindset also, I'll talk about that in a bit, but 
uh, stay in touch and stay engaged and keep them engaged in their health and wellness, which is very different, right? So some of these new characteristics are that patients themselves and consumers themselves um, are more frequently connecting uh, with health systems, want more frequent connections. They want this ability to ping their, their, their care provider uh, whenever they feel anxious about, about any um, aspect of their health. Um, they want it to be bi-directional. They don't just want to be the people initiating this. They do want the serendipitousness of maybe a clinician reaching out to them sometimes and asking how they're just doing, you know, pretty much like their family members do, right? So they want it bi-directional. Digital is becoming an expectation. It's no longer a, a neat thing to have or a differentiator. It is part of the service. It is an expectation, especially among um, younger patients, you know, who are uh, more used to uh, a connected type of universe around them for various other services. And that's just become their culture, you know, be it my kids or uh, be it uh, folks that are older than my kids too. I also feel that uh, this, there's this new type of digital plus um, culture that's coming out that is going to require us to um, have a lot more engagements with our patients. Um, you know, this is uh, not just the regular digital that we see, but there are additional things that consumers will engage with on the periphery of health, you know, like for example, embeddables or security, home security systems, sending you data and the expectation from the consumer that you use that in some way uh, to better enable their health. Uh, peripherals uh, like um, your watch, you know, that's uh, telling somebody when you have a fall and the expectation is that you as a health system or you as a clinic uh, or you as a physician are going to respond to an alert like that, right? So that's this digital plus kind of culture that I feel is developing and we have to evolve to, to meet it somewhere in the center or along the periphery. The pros and cons of this are, you know, the pros are the pros first. I'm more of an optimist. So, um, so the pros I think are there's there's going to be this increased focus on health, not just health care. Nobody wants to really get sick, and then have to access care, right? They want to stay healthy as long as possible. Um, you know, we hope and pray for that many times, right? A day sometimes, and uh, uh, and and so there is this continuous desire to be healthy and not really require to access um, health care. So health care has to evolve to meet that need. It doesn't mean that uh, you know, there isn't going to be health care into the future, there is. Uh, very much like how digital and, and um, uh, other types of uh, consumer culture changed other industries, we are gonna have to change with that expectation, right? And, um, and so our health services are going to have to change and it'll have to be more continuous, as I mentioned earlier in the new characteristics. The, uh, the one con that I see from this is that, um, well, there, are, there are a few, but the, the most, um, uh, the, the, the primary one kind of is just the load that it might place on us as health systems, right? There's a clinical load that will, uh, that will seep into our minds, our lives, if we don't manage it properly. Uh, I have some suggestions for for that uh, coming up. So uh, and how to handle that. So uh, so yes, there will be that clinical load. There'll also be a technological load. There'll be a design load. Things that we'll have to come to terms with and accept as being part of the way we provide service. It's not an option. So um, uh, but but the upside is just better health, right? Better health for all the people in our communities the people that we serve as a mission-centric organization also. So how do you do this, right? What, how do you foster engagement? And I have three ways that, uh, you know, I'm sure there's more ways to do this, but uh, three key ways I see are um, to handle this load, we need to have certain levels of cognitive automation. So we need to be able to simplify 
uh, the, um, the process for our clinicians. We need to take care of our care providers, right? Uh, and to do that, we have to, <clears throat> we have to enable some level of cognitive automation for them so, uh, so that they can make decisions quickly on actionable insights, not just data, right? So they need to receive actionable insights and then be able to respond very quickly to, uh, to their patients, to our consumers. And sometimes we may even want to have triggered actions for, to our consumers that don't need clinical intervention also, so that it, it, it serves as a engagement point. You know, it serves as a way for the, or a nudge to the consumer to get back to us with either information or a query or some way that keeps them connected to us in a way that benefits their health. So, um, so that's, uh, and then finally, I think we need to engage others because this load could be difficult for us to care, right? So we've got to engage others in the community, the support networks around the patient, their caregivers, their families, their extended families. We've got to get them into this ecosystem of care and leverage them, not, not just understand that they're there, but actually give them the ability, if it's through digital means, um, uh, to engage in the care of the person that we are also responsible for. Right? So I think that is going to be more and more important. And, and through digital platforms, it's possible to do that. So that's on patient engagement. Um, there's this other evolution of, uh, of care, right? And that is viewing patients as consumers. I've spoken about this a bit um, um, uh, in, the, in the previous slide also, uh, because patient engagement and the increase in patient engagement is also due to us viewing patients as consumers and patients themselves viewing themselves as consumers. You know? so, uh, so I think that is um, a natural thing that is going to happen. Um, and is already happening. We're seeing new consumption patterns, like uh, patients going to virtual health marketplaces, you know, and, uh, um, and accessing care ad hoc. You know, they may not have a relationship with uh, that particular health system. They may not even see the person they're seeing as connected to our health system, but rather as a discrete provider using some uh, available telehealth platform uh, to, um, uh, to provide care. And why? Would someone do that? Because uh, they want personalized experiences. They want speed. They want on-the-go asynchronous engagement, you know, not necessarily a video call all the time, but, uh, you know, some forms of asynchronous engagement also. You know, I'm on the train. I, I have a question about my health, right? I just want to be able to open up an app or a website uh, on my phone and type in a question about it and have a physician answer and tell me uh, or relieve my anxiety if I'm anxious about something. And they certainly do want personalized experiences and they'll give us the data, right, to enable that type of personalized experience or even the access because there is a good trust relationship with, uh, with a clinician, with a system uh, that we see right now in patients, more so than they even have with any tech companies, right? Um, and then uh, I think, uh, consumers also want this continuous, as I mentioned earlier, this continuous type of engagement. They want to talk to somebody, even sometimes if it isn't a person, uh, but it is a, maybe a programmed bot or a cognitive bot that they're talking to. So, um, so these, I think, are new consumption patterns. Uh, what is behind those consumption patterns are the very discrete new behaviors uh, where you're seeing patients, um, you know, uh, prefer convenience over cost, right? So, uh, so there is that. Uh, then speed over loyalty and experience over relationship. Uh, you know, I, I see uh, patients evolving into, um, uh, you know, if I need something now, I will pay for it and that kind of mindset. And so that's convenience over cost. Speed over loyalty. So, uh, you know, I don't want to have to wait in a waiting room and yes, I know I would have liked to see that specific provider that I have some kind of relationship or loyalty to or a system that I have loyalty to, but speed is important to me too. I'm a busy person, um, you know, and so I will give more uh, uh, preference to speed over that loyalty and I will maybe walk into a, 
a, a clinic that that sees me very quickly or i'll pick up my phone and and get on a uh, on demand virtual call and uh, uh and, and 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 really exercise that speed over loyalty preference and overall also uh, patients as consumers are starting to prefer experience over relationship um, so what's my total experience? When I talk about experience, I mean a closed loop type of experience, you know, an experience that continues beyond the episode, you know, and even during the episode provides an experience that delights, right? And uh, I talk about that in the next section, which is realigning to the consumer. What do we do with these patient behaviors changing? What do we do that should be different, right? So we should focus on on models of care that enable rapid access, you know, make it really quick for patients to, uh, to see our, our, our providers. If this means um, our care providers, if this means uh, changing the way that we operate, we've got to start doing that. If it means physical changes in our space, we've got to start doing that. And there's costs associated with it. We have to look at the benefit from it too. Um, the, uh, the convenience, you know, we've got to change that mindset. It's uh, uh, we've got to move beyond maybe the the nine to five doctor's hours kinds of things to uh, to looking at other types of models. Also, you know, the anytime, wherever they are types of models. You know, maybe in virtual because it may not be possible physical. We've got to start really changing our minds around that. I I don't just mean on paper. I mean actually doing something about it. Right. Um, these, this is not about just press releases or something like that. You have to build a sustainable model behind that. Um, so that's really, really important. Um, and, and, and the patient wants this, right? Anytime, anywhere uh, type, of, uh, type of access. And then finally, on experience, uh, we've got to, as I said earlier when we started, uh, we've got to close the loop around experiences. You know, we've got to heal Yes, we've got to move beyond episodes. And then in that experience, in that closed loop experience, we have to delight to, we have to make things easier for the patient, not just, um, you know, you know uh, not just a simple or frictionless type of experience. And then finally, um, what, what are these patient-centric innovations, right? We take the consumer, patient as consumer concept, we take patient engagement and the need to be continuously connected with the patient, and then we wonder, okay, well, how do I enable this? What types of maybe tech innovations uh, should I invest in? And um, I think uh, we have to start a little bit further up, which we normally don't, you know, further up that discovery kind of process in, in healthcare for a patient, right? Uh, the patient journey doesn't start when they walk into our office or even engage on an app, right? It starts in their discovery process. Where did they go? Where did they search? Can we make it easier for them, even in the search process, to find us as well as to engage with us? So I think it's important to think about those things, inform our patients, be there for them wherever they are, right? If they're in the search process, be there. If they're on a, uh, on a uh, voice uh, assistant, you know, be there too. So we have to participate in that informed discovery process, right? And inform them. Um, as they discover uh, options for their care. And this is not just, you know, thinking about, oh, right now they're switching a, a job or something. This is continuously, okay? Uh, we have to target our content, make sure it meets the needs of, of, of our patients through a search, not just give them a generic website, that kind of thing. Um, we also have to be transparent as much as possible. It is hard to know the total cost of everything <clears throat> in healthcare sometimes of a, of a single procedure because it varies based on the patient's condition also. And, but, uh, you know, it's important to at least provide some sense of transparency into the future. And that's a big task in healthcare. And so that's a big innovation. You know, no one's figured it out entirely yet. So we've got to start doing that. And the stars need to align a little bit also from the multiple sides that, uh, uh, that service healthcare, right? The payer, the provider, uh, the pharma companies and such, um, medical device organizations and, and, and so on. Um, the um, frictionless engagements, that's a word you don't normally hear in healthcare, uh, but, uh, and frictionless, entirely frictionless, is even more, right? Um, 
So I think we've got to try and do that. We've got to make it as frictionless as let's say watching a Netflix movie, right? Um, we've got to make it that easy um, and, 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 and smoothen things out for, for patients as they go through the process. I think we also need to create some form of, um, you know, simple engagement uh, with, with patients, you know, and health indices might do that. What is my health really today like? You know, is there an index for that? Just like stock market indexes create, made it simple for people to invest or simpler rather, um, I think um, we need to have some form of health indices too to uh, indicate to people okay, this is where you are with your health. If you need to make it better, this is what you need to do. And then we can work towards some kind of plan like that. Um, I think we need to focus, as I mentioned earlier, on low latency services. That means speed, 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 you know, being able to serve our patients as and when they need them, uh, need our services, right? So we have to be able to react that quickly and, and build sustainable business models behind that. <clears throat> it's easy to say, it's very hard to execute and keep it or sustain it rather over time in a feasible way. So, so we have to get creative and start doing this now. Um, I think from a technology perspective, there are many things we can do. Uh, you know, we will have to interact passively with health monitoring systems. Uh, sorry, interact with health monitoring systems that are more passive, right? So things like embeddables, sensors, embeddables as in things we put into our bodies, we already have them with, with uh, pacemakers and the such, you know, but they haven't been connected in the past. Now we'll have em embeddables that will be connected. They'll tell us things about a patient, maybe even the chemical com composition of your blood, you know, continuously in case you want to track uh, medication adherence and those types of things. Those things are coming and some of them are already here. <laughs> so, uh, so we're going to have to have this open mind to, um, to see this passive health information. They can even come from your uh, home security systems, right? Your gait can be measured, your movement can be measured through these systems. And slowly we'll have to start accepting that, not all that data, but at least the insights from that data. And maybe even all of that data, you know, sensors and the internet of things, or IoT, uh, are things that we have to keep an open mind to and, and, and start using effectively. Uh, then on the on the low threshold asynchronous engagement side, um, I think I mentioned this earlier. Uh, I will say it again because I, I believe firmly that we need to uh, invest in these areas. Um, you know, uh, yes, the 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 market doesn't uh, enable payments behind them and those types of things. But we've got to start changing that because it's important for the health and wellness and the reduction of anxiety in a lot of our patients, right? So we've got, to, uh, we've got to make sure that we can enable the patient at any time to ask us questions, maybe not even us, but chatbots or cognitive types of digital assistants, as I mentioned in the next point. Uh, we've got to provide actionable insights and nudges more than just data. You know, this data was great a few years ago, but now we've got to give people insights and nudge them towards a certain path that we want them to take to better their health. Uh, we have to invest in cognitive conversational digital health assistance, you know, so, so that we take some of that load off our clinicians and have them focus on the relationship aspect and the, uh, and the, um, and, and the health aspect of, of, of any, any of our patients in our community. And then uh, we've got to embrace health at anywhere, not just at home, uh, you know, but at work, at home, at play, wherever a person is, right? Be able to reach them where they are, not pull them to where we want them to be in terms of physical space or even a virtual space. Uh, we need to focus on experiences that are focused really on just health and wellness, not just health care. Um, and then finally, uh, I think as we engage people, we delight them, we heal them, we also need to pull some of that back to us, right? Um, get feedback, figure out if you're doing the right things and have systems for that that are almost immediate, just like you see in, let's say, a Zoom call when you end it. You know, sometimes you see a very immediate organic, did that call go well for you? You know, and you just hit a, a, a check mark or a thumbs up and there's feedback, right? It doesn't take too much time away. It's not a huge survey but it's telling you a lot about your service and whether people like it. 
and then ultimately using that to have other people promote your brand, promote your service so that you can sustain that into the future because you need that to sustain it, even give to you possibly and build philanthropy and those types of channels into it. But I think this um, is our near future. You know, there'll be many other things probably that will change in the next year or two. Um, hopefully it doesn't take a pandemic for us to realize that. <clears throat> and, um, and I hope that, uh, that we can all move towards this, this, this awesome future, not just of healthcare, but of health. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Myra Davis, the Chief Information and Innovation Officer here at Texas Children's. Um, the lovely background you see behind me is actually a picture of the Texas Medical Center. To my right is one of our buildings, our many buildings. And then the direct behind me, you will see what we also know, famously known as our Miracle Bridge that connects our pediatric hospital and our women and children's hospital together. So with that said, I'm going to get us started um, and talk about the engaged patient as a consumer. Like many of you, we at Texas Children's have experienced a rapid growth in the development of telemedicine as a response to COVID. Prior to COVID, we were slowly ramping up video visits across the system, and COVID actually propelled us forward as many of the regulatory limitations were removed. Limitations such as credentialing, ability to treat patients at home, or even offer therapies such as physical therapy. I wanna highlight the metrics on the screen here. We actually trained within a two month time frame about 1600 physicians. We went from 89 video visits in the month of March to where we are now approximately 2000 plus visits. I will say, as you can see from the graph, we had a significant increase and we sort of plateaued to where we really feel comfortable where our video visits are today. Since COVID, we have actually honed in and focused on helping our patients become consumers of care so that we're meeting them where they are instead of conforming to us. And what I mean by that is we're focused in these five areas, the physical presence, how we've physically seen them historically, we want to provide the same experience to them through a video visit or an electronic visit. We want to also ensure that our culture translates to how we see them through a video visit. It's often acknowledged that sometimes the culture through a screen is not as authentic as it is in person. So this is something we want to impress upon our patients that we want to continue to focus on building trust to improve that experience. From a technological standpoint, we want to ensure that the literacy is there. In linguistics, we have a very diverse patient population, and it's really important to us that video visits are accommodating or are equally as diverse. And devices are enabled to put control in our patients' hands. We couple this focus with what we've known as the patient journey. This journey is outlined here, but I can only imagine in healthcare, it's the same journey that many of you face. You're introduced into the organization as a patient. You begin to schedule a visit. You actually have the visit. There's a follow-up, and then there's ongoing monitoring. I think what I really want to emphasize here from an innovative standpoint as we looked at this is that introduction to the patient is seen as our digital doorway. It's also closely aligned to the culture, how you see us, is definitely important to us digitally as it is for our physical presence. The ability to schedule visits are equally the same, easy and accommodating to map to the focus that I talked about earlier. So I'm gonna walk you through how the patient journey and those five focus areas we see coming together. We've taken our journey and mapped it along with our focus. Here is how we envision the patient is intersecting with the actual journey. To the left, you'll see the focus areas that I talked about earlier, and to the right, you now see a vertical alignment of our journey. I'm gonna start by talking through the introduction, the digital doorway. We think it's important, as I mentioned, for in-person virtual visits to be equally the same. It should be easier online as it is to pull, to actually walk through a door. We're also, from an innovation standpoint, looking at ways to provide patients with second opinions, 
So that it drives an expert a care from our expert caregivers. When it comes to scheduling a visit, we can schedule any type of visit online, including those patients that have never been presented or seen at Texas Children's before. They can be referred, or these are, um, are they can be referred to our specialists, or they can be on-demand on demand patients, meaning at point in time, such as in, similar to that of an urgent care. Encounters, the actual visit, we have a concept called the virtual roaming visit, where we test all aspects of the video visits prior to the provider in, entering the room. This is something that's really important as we have realized and we have heard from our families that it reduces the stress for the families in, in ensuring that the technology works, which also speaks to the technological literacy for our families. And in some cases, sometimes our physicians need that training and need that comfort as well. The ability for our families to just use their devices so they can enhance the visit. And in finding solutions, this is an area of opportunity that we continue to explore, bandwidth challenges. We serve the entire Houston um, uh, population, multiple counties, and in many areas, it's rural populations where bandwidth is not always ideal. So it's important for us to continue to focus in that area. As a follow-up, one of the focus areas that we have um, mastered is the handoff between our specialists and our primary care providers. They have the ability to schedule patients directly and the patients with the use of our patient portal can also schedule their appointments if there's a referral that takes place. And then lastly, monitoring. Continuing to look at ways to provide remote monitoring once the patient leaves and while they're at home. Through the patient portal, our providers have access to communicate with our families through the, through the portal. And then from a physiological monitoring standpoint with devices, from a, this is an area that, as I said before, we are continuing to explore. Hi, I'm Zane Burke. Thanks for joining today and appreciate the opportunity of Health and Chime to share a little bit about consumer-centered virtual care and the virtuous business model in healthcare. A little bit about me. I've been at uh, Livongo for the past two years as the CEO of the largest digital help IPO. And some of you may have heard a little bit about the recent merger with Teladoc and the combination to create the largest digital health company in the world. We've had some good success at, at Livongo and you can see some of the companies we work with today. It's my pleasure to share a few of my experiences in this space with you all. I think the biggest part is really that none of us really want to be in the healthcare system. All of us want to be as close to home as we possibly can be in the best health status that we can possibly be in. And in order to do that, I've always had this long belief that technology, services, data science creates an opportunity for us to create a different kind of healthcare experience and a different kind of model by which we all want to receive care. Because we actually don't enter the healthcare system for the service itself. We enter it because we want to get out to spend time with our grandkids or go to a football game or play the guitar or whatever it is that motivates each one of us. It's that in healthcare really has never been designed to be centric to the person. And that's a bit about what I want to talk about today. Life is changing. And what changed dramatically here is really the changing of virtual health overall. And what we saw was, uh, in, in recently was great adoption on the telehealth side uh, and a lot of adoption on the remote monitoring side. In a pre-pandemic era, we were seeing quite a bit of growth on, in both of those industries where you saw triple digit growth for a company like Lavongo on digital health, and you were seeing 30% growth in telehealth visits in a company like Teladoc. Well, with the pandemic, I'd say the, the genie's totally out of the bottle here, where now what you saw in the post-pandemic era is where 90% of in-person visits went to telehealth visits, where you see 70% of health hospital executives 
saying that they're going to be working with a remote monitoring solution in the next year or already are doing so. And then as importantly, or maybe even more importantly, the regulatory changes and the reimbursement is catching up with telehealth and with remote monitoring by which the system will reimburse for those kinds of uh, charges, those kinds of visits. And this really creates a totally different dynamic. So the pace of change is now rapid upon us and is going to move incredibly quickly as we move over the next several months and years. And when you think about it, the impact for consumers and the impact for payers and employers and for healthcare system, everybody has a win if they'll embrace this as part of this. For consumers, it's a totally different experience. It's based on really creating a consumer-centric experience where people don't just like their experience, they love it. And you'll see that from some of the studies by McKinsey and others where 75% of people are now interested in using virtual care, where in a pre-COVID environment, it was around 10%. And you'll see that people will actually make changes with their physicians if they do not offer a telehealth access piece. So gone are the days of organize around the physician, it's organized around the consumer. It's organized around the member. And that does create challenges, but it also creates great opportunities because for the payers and the employers, it can create a better experience for their members or for their employees. And they're seeing strong clinical outcomes from these types of services. So for instance, in the case of Lovongo, we're seeing dramatic clinical improvements for persons with diabetes around A1C uh, improvements. We're seeing improvements around those persons with hypertension uh, and, and clinically relevant and, and significant elements. That translates into hard return on investments for employers and plans. So there is going to be this adoption of the digital virtual care model on a go forward basis. And for healthcare systems, it really creates additional opportunities for those that actively embrace those models. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means, but I think it creates also an opportunity for better experience for healthcare professionals overall, as they now can think about working in a model in a, in a, virtual, in a virtual way. Let's talk about the need and the real why. The why is people, the why is all of us. And ultimately, as I often say, healthcare is personal. And it's incredibly personal uh, for those that have chronic conditions. And right now is even more important because of the coronavirus and the pandemic time period, because of the challenges that we have in the healthcare system uh, overall, we've got to keep people, especially those that are vulnerable, out of harm's way. And a great way to do that is through virtual care. Persons with chronic conditions are much more susceptible to bad outcomes from in the coronavirus era in terms of higher morbidities, longer, more, more ICU visits. Uh, and there are ways through the digital and virtual care model by which we can keep people out of the healthcare system and make their lives better and safer overall. And the reason to do that is because Almost half of the adults in America have a chronic condition, which is staggering. Almost 90% of the US healthcare spend is for persons with chronic conditions. This is where we can make a big impact. This is where we can meet the member where they are in their life flow, change the clinical outcomes as well as the financial outcomes by using a virtual care model and thinking about reimagining the healthcare system in a different way through these virtual care systems. At Livongo, what we've done is create a platform for chronic condition management. We started with diabetes management and we moved into hypertension and weight management and then behavioral health. And the reasons for those are because if you're a person with type two diabetes, 
you're more you're seventy percent likely to have hypertension, and if you have more than one condition, you're more likely to have a behavioral health challenge, so anxiety or depression. And people want to be treated as people, not as a condition, not as a separate disease state. They don't want to be thought of as a diabetic. They want to be per treated as the person. And creating a whole person platform by which we help the member engage in their own care and engage when they see fit in their life flow will create better and better outcomes overall. And we have the science to prove all of those pieces. Talked a little bit about upfront that we're in the midst of the largest healthcare IT merger in the history. And what the, the notion of this is really how to bring together different capabilities to create a consumer-centered virtual healthcare model. And this is a little bit about the genie out of the bottle. There's a recognition that we have to change quickly, that we've got to be mobile to have all the pieces together to create a better experience, to create great clinical outcomes and hard financial ROI and bring the consumers together to create better experience. And the more data we have, the better experiences we can create for our members overall. And in creating this virtual care leader, you can see 70 million lives that when we put the two entities together, the data from all the pieces that we have around all the disease elements and diabetes, hypertension, weight management, behavioral health, combined with the clinical information from our partners at Teladoc will create an incredibly robust virtual care model and really allow for a different experience It'll allow for the full continuum of care to be performed on behalf of the consumers and really that consumer-centric model. And Teladoc's broad presence across multiple countries allows for us from a Wabongo perspective to move from outside the US to a broader international footprint because these challenges are worldwide. They're not just here in the US. And so we have the opportunity to make an impact broadly around the world as we move forward. If you think about what it means for physicians, so those of you who are thinking about what does that mean for the docs, it means they're going to have real-time information. They're going to have access to the biometric information at home. It also means that people are practicing at the top of their licensure. So whether that is through certified diabetes educators in, in our team, or whether it's through the, the nutritionists, or whether it's the, the physicians operating at the top of their license, this allows for a more efficient and effective healthcare model overall, and one that creates an incredible experience for members and for consumers in total. If your healthcare system out there thinking about what you ought to do as you move forward, which is how do you create that front, that digital front door? So how do you become part of that experience and what kinds of things can you do to engage your consumers and your marketplaces, to engage your physicians, to make sure that you're connected into those virtual care models and understand how that works. The changes from reimbursement create many opportunities from a revenue enhancement perspective, which is a challenging thing for health systems right now. This is one of those areas where you can increase your revenue enhancement by creating a remote monitoring experience across Medicare populations, leveraging the new CMS regs and the reimbursement pieces and creating that better experience, enhancing revenue, and create and also giving something back to your physicians overall with a better physician experience. So when you're thinking about the virtual care model and digital health overall, it's really important to embrace this up front and to think about how can you change your revenue models in order to create revenue and look at this as a positive versus how does this move my cheese to a different space. Appreciate spending time with you today and look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.